I am Elle Penelope, author of Epic Fantasy and Paranormal Romance, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello friends, today is Sunday, February 21st, 2021, and this is episode 108 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. This episode is sponsored by the newest romantic comedy from best-selling author Marina Adair, Hopeless Romantic, which asks whether two of a small town's biggest hearts can learn to put themselves first in the name of love. Beckett Hayes is the caregiver for her autistic brother. She runs a personal concierge service, is her town's unofficial special needs advocate, and trains emotional support animals. With all of that going on, there's not much time for love. 16 years ago, Levi Rhodes postponed his life to help his family after his father's untimely death. When these two good-natured hearts meet, the temptation is hard to resist. Perfect for fans of Jill Shalvis and Christina Lauren, Publishers Weekly called Hopeless Romantic, Lighthearted and Humorous, A Sweet, Satisfying Romance. You can get your copy of Hopeless Romantic by Marina Adair wherever books are sold or at kensingtonbooks.com. So this week's best thing is a tie. We finally finished season five of The Expanse on Amazon Prime, and it was really fantastic. Um, I wasn't the biggest fan of season four. That was my least favorite series. And I think it's always my least favorite season. I think it's always hard when you take a show that starts out in space, and then you put it on a planet, and everything has changed, the dynamics change. But you realize the need for everything when you get to season five. And what I really love about the show is that because it was based on a series of books that are complete, or they were further in the books than the TV show when it started, so they knew where they were going, um, it just feels so interconnected and interwoven, and the story connects so well. Even as each season is a little bit different, it doesn't completely jump the shark. Like, as much as I like Star Trek Discovery, season three was my least favorite. It felt like a completely different thing. Like, maybe they didn't, they didn't know what they were going towards that when they started at the beginning of season one. Whereas with The Expanse, it feels like very sure-footed, like you feel like they know where they're going, they're setting everything up, they're linking things back in a really connected way because they have the books to go on. So I loved that. The second tie winner for this week's best thing is the new book by Kate Stradling, who's one of my favorite authors. I, it dropped on Friday and I finished it yesterday, The Air and the Spare. And it is a really, really taut book. It's one of those books where you have no idea how it's going to end. Like it's a romantic fantasy, so you know how it's going to end, but you have no idea how they're going to get there. Like I was like, what? What is happening? How are they going to get out of this? How are they going to solve this problem? How are they going to get together? Like everything. It was just tightly woven, really tight um, conflict between the two characters and in the story conflict natural. I just really enjoyed it. I like everything she writes. So if you are in the mood for a really fantastic fantasy romance, The Air and the Spare, and also anything that Kate Stradling writes. And I will link to it in the show notes. Other things that I watched, we saw Judas and the Black Messiah, which was also really good. I thought the performances were were the best thing about that. Um, I didn't have a problem with the rest of it. It just was... A downer, obviously. So that's the film about Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers and the FBI and COINTELPRO and how they had um, William O'Neill, who was the Judas, the traitor, embedded in their midst as he was an informant for the FBI. Um, And and I knew a little about that, but not not a lot. So it's just one of those movies that just makes you mad (laughs) at the country and the world and life in general. And the government, especially, of course. <sighs> but it's a good movie. So, in my writing update, whew, this week, it had been going really smoothly, and I know that that can't happen forever. So this was the week when it really started to fall apart. I spent all week on one chapter, chapter 19. And why was that? So originally, you know, I have my outline, I'm a plotter, I plan everything in advance, I know it's going to change around the midpoint. I sort of expected that. Um, so we've gotten just past 50% according to my outline, and when we hit chapter 19. So I think the problem was that I was had to, this chapter had to lay groundwork for the next few chapters. 
basically the next sequence of the book, if you want to think of it in sequences. And a sequence is a group of chapters, you know, you can split your book into sequences and the sequences can be split into chapters and chapters are split into scenes and scenes are split into beats, you know, like everything has a smaller component, like quantum physics sort of. <laughs> and uh, so I'm laying groundwork and I'm, I'm looking at the thing I'm building towards and that thing doesn't feel right. So I can't lay the groundwork in this chapter. And so then I have to figure out why doesn't that feel right? And that's what we call being stuck. Like I could write, I could write what I had planned, but it didn't feel right. So what do I do when I get stuck? I try to back up a little bit and regroup. Um, at first I thought this was just a middle issue, like the middle of, of books are hard to write. It's hard to sustain the conflict. Um, you know, you have the beginning, you, you know, the end, the, the the middle is the meat of it, but for some reason it's always the most difficult. And I thought it was just um, just a problem with holding the whole story in my head. Like, I know that there are threads that I'm missing, but that's going to have to be another pass. I can't do everything in this pass. So I was thinking a lot about what has to happen for Act 3 to take place, because I, I reviewed my whole outline, and I really liked my Act 3. You know, I feel like that's where it's supposed to be. So where I am now is the second half of Act 2. I looked at the character arcs, I looked at the subplots, um, I looked at the main story arc to make sure I'm going where I think I'm going, and I realized that the problem was my plot, my structure, I should say. So when I first started writing, I pantsed everything. I just started writing and, you know, years ago, and I never finished anything like that. I never finished a book. Short stories, you can pants. I could pants. Um, I did not ever successfully pants a, a whole novel. And so I moved very quickly away from that once I figured out how to plot. And I had plotted this book using the Save the Cat Writes a Novel method. And I made worksheets. If you've been listening, remember that I, I redid the worksheet. I actually put it on my website if anyone wants that. Save the Cat Beat Sheet worksheet. So in the Save the Cat method of plotting, um, after the midpoint, so the second half of Act 2 is bad guys close in. And that is sort of where the stakes get raised, you know, the antagonist gets stronger, but also your um, main characters are getting the things that they need to hit the end, so the things that they need to win in the end. But also, their flaw closes in. Um, so part of the character arc is that your main character is dealing with some sort of um, deficit in their world. And this, the point of the story is that they can overcome this flaw and then they have what they need to win. So there's two things that they need to win. They need whatever the external plot requires and they need whatever their internal character arc requires. And that's how I was approaching it. And so I had you know, gone through the points that I needed, all is lost, so you have bad guys close in, then you have all is lost where the hero hits rock bottom, then you have the Dark Knight of the Soul, which is where they process everything. And um, I always think of that as the use the force Luke beat, where they're at their the worst point. Dark Knight, you know, they've just gotten into the biggest pit of the story and they realize that thing that they need. Use the force Luke. So he uses the force to guide the, the um, X-Wing. I realized all of those beats that I had were not right. Like I had... A, a sequence that I could have used for that. I had things there. I was, you know, they were they were um, addressing her flaw. The all is lost was at the point at which her flaw was the worst and she had given into it and then she reaps the consequences, my main character, and then she has that realization, um, Dark Knight of the Soul, that epiphany, and she goes and she fixes it. She gets the team back together and they're ready to go back into Act 3. But for some reason, I couldn't get there. Like, it all looked fine on paper. It sounded good. It hit the points I needed to hit structurally. It was sound. It didn't feel right. It took a few days of brainstorming, of going back through my notes in my notebook, going back to my original synopsis. So the way that I work is usually I write a version of the story before I try to put the plot points in. I just write what I think should happen. And then I structure it. So I take what I think should happen and I plot it in and then I see where the holes are in my structure and I add, move, change things to um, to fit the structure so that it will be structurally sound. And I realized that when I did that, my original synopsis before structure didn't have 
all of this stuff in it. So that this second half of act two stuff, there's this whole sequence of events, what I just described about her, um, her all is lost, her dark night of the soul. That stuff wasn't there. What I had done was take my original synopsis where I had a version of that, but I put it in a different place. I pushed it off into act three because in Save the Cat Writes a Novel, they have this five-step finale. And so it's sort of a redux of that second half of act two. Um, So in the five-step finale, they have gathering the team, executing the plan, the high tower surprise, digging deep down, and executing new plan. Long story short, or maybe still long, because I am such like a concrete thinker, and because I wanted to hit the structure, I think that I added stuff I didn't need that wasn't in my original synopsis in order to hit the structure. And then when I got to write that part, I realized, oh no, I don't need that. I added that just for these reasons. And what I had before, before I was trying to hit the structure and the plot points was actually better. So I reworked my entire outline and the stuff that I thought was my five-step finale, I kind of pushed up into all is lost, dark night of the soul. Because if you think about it, if you look at those five steps, gathering the team, ex- executing the plan, um, that's sort of just like the bad guys close in. High tower surprise is when um, is really another all is lost. You know, dig deep down is another dark night of the soul. And this probably makes more sense if you're familiar with the system, but it just seemed like that concept, which I think is really interesting, and I did use successfully in my last book, but it wasn't, it caused me to duplicate things. Like, I was struggling because I was like, well, I have the perfect all is lost, but it's really my high tower surprise. And I was brainstorming and thinking about this and also talking to someone else. So um, my very good friend, Inez Johnson, and because we write together in the mornings, and so she knew that I was struggling with the writing and the plotting and I think I had come to that idea and then talking through with her just solidified it because she had come to the same idea as I was telling her what was happening and I was like yeah that is uh that felt immediately better once I redid the outline and thought about it this way it just started being clear so I ended up taking out three chapters five scenes of that whole sequence that I was going to do because not only did it not feel right? It was a distraction from the actual point of the book. Like I had this whole side thing just so I could hit the points and then come back and get to the part that I was actually excited about, which was my act three and the part I really wanted to get to write. So in doing that, I still have to make it structurally sound. Like I still have to resolve the internal character arc. Um, There were things that were happening in that sequence that I ended up removing that don't have to happen in that way but still have to happen. And so plotting and structure have helped me because before I learned how to do that, A, I wasn't finishing books, and B, you know, the main feedback I would get from my editors, from my um, freelance editor, from my self-published work, and my traditional published editor were similar feedback. It was like, the structure needs to be shored up. Um, You know, look at these beats, see if you can hit them. And so I think on the one hand, hitting them is important because it makes your story, as Sean Coyne, uh, the author of Story Grid, says it makes it work. You know, you want to have a story that works. And a story that works is one, in my mind, that just feels right, that feels natural. Um, but in trying to make it work, you can do too much. And I was, it was being very manipulative. I was forcing way too much to happen. I realized that the character I was writing wasn't going to do that naturally. And then I was like, well, how can I make her do it? And that's always the wrong thing. Like, I'm not one of those people who believes that my characters speak to me from the heavens and I just transcribe their words. Uh, I, I do think that my authorial hand is at play a lot more. But at the same time, you have to let things flow or else they'll feel forced. And you can't just wedge your characters into these weird positions because you need them to to do that. Like they are who they are and they're gonna act in a way that is natural for them if you're doing your job right as the author. And 
if they're not doing that, something is wrong. Either the character is wrong or the situation that you're putting them in is wrong. So structure and plot are really important to me, but I do have the tendency to overdo it, overthink it, over plot it maybe, or, or just try to, I mean, it's the high compliance thing. It's trying to make it right, trying to adhere to the, the plot points too strictly. Um, and it's not actually too strictly because the interesting thing about plotting systems is that while multiple plotting systems basically say the same thing, you can even take the same plotting system and the same story and find and like map it to different beats. So Star Wars is used a lot as an example of hero's journey. And I think a lot of plotting systems come from, or if they don't come from hero's journey, they at least, you can map them to hero's journey. You can say, okay, this is basically this, and this is this, and this is that. And Save the Cat is the same way. You know, like I often, when I get stuck, try it from a different plotting system and see if I can slot it into those buckets. But if you take Star Wars, for example, I have seen different points talked about as, say, the All is Lost or the Dark Knight of the Soul within the same movie. So it's not like there's only one way to to do it because you can look at the same movie and the same plotting system and different people will come at it from different ways and and find different things in it. There's a lot of flexibility there. And my mind isn't naturally flexible. I have to really strive hard to achieve any sort of flexibility. That if I think this is the way it should be, then that's the way it should be. And I will bang my head against the wall for a week until I realize, okay, maybe it could be another way. Like in some ways I'm really flexible because there's sometimes I'm open to the possibilities of the story. Like I'm open to reworking everything if I have to, if that's what it needs. But when there's a system in place, my nature is to adhere to the system. And I think I just adhere to the system wrong in this case. And I had to redo it. I'm still using the same system. Um, I haven't looked at the, the five-step finale again since I kind of re- since I shifted things around so I could not do that I could have the finale not I mean or maybe those five steps are just tinier you know like I think I have them spread out over a larger period so that I can take that duplicate those duplicate beats and move them up to the first way where they feel better and maybe once I dig in deeper to the finale I will discover oh there's five smaller beats there that match up with these five steps that are in that book so hopefully that makes sense. I spent a week on chapter 19, which was not in the plan, but then I also ended up removing three chapters from the whole story. So I guess I'm back on schedule. <laughs> I did a quick revision of the outline and um, so, I, so that I could continue writing and at least know the new groundwork I'm laying in the chapter that I'm writing, where I'm going now. I I do have a feeling that I will be able to look at the finale and find those five steps again within the new version of it. Regarding the exposition that I was talking about last week, I did find a way through that. Um, So my, my eventual solution was to sort of have this narrator that has been present at certain parts of the book tell a version of the story. And then in the next scene, the characters react to it. The characters have read the document. The reader knows from this narration what what the important parts were. And then the characters are reacting to it and you're getting a little bit more detail that way. And so that felt like there was enough tension. I don't know. Yeah, I would say tension. There There was enough like narrative interest in this narrator kind of character telling the story and then you go into a scene where there's five people talking about it and planning and trying to figure out what to do with this information so so far that feels right but I did I really did struggle with multiple ways of telling that um and you know the last couple of times I read it I, I do think that I like it that's subject to change as is everything 
I don't remember if I mentioned it before, but I did have this issue in Cry of Metal and Bone where, um, you know, one of the new characters is telling a story to another character. And that story is actually a whole novella. There's a whole novella that tells exactly what happens, but I know that everyone hasn't read the novella. So I give you the recap and the recap is, hey, why don't you tell this person what happened to you last or two years ago? And he's like, oh, really? And so then he tells the story. And that is, I don't know if that was entirely successful, but that is because I never felt like a hundred percent, like that was the best way to do it. But that is how I approached it in that book and did something a little bit different in this book. But yeah, it's still, exposition is always going to be something that I have to think about a lot. So now I think that I'm back on track with the book for now. And it did feel nice shaving off three chapters. I can't, I can't lie. I don't know what that's going to do to my word count. Um, because I'm, I'm targeting 80 to 85,000 words. And I feel now, I feel like now I might be closer to 70, 75. Um, but we'll see what happens. And then I do, f I have like a little niggling sensation that there is something I'm still missing, like another chapter that I'm going to discover I need as I go through. So word count is not my primary concern because I know that this book will, will go through more revision, um, but, and revision for me is generally adding things. <laughs> so yeah, but it is, I do think about that because I have over time kind of gotten this um, instinctual feeling about how, about how long a book will be. And I've been right most of the time, so I'm feeling it's a little bit shorter than I wanted it. But that happens when you cut out three chapters. <laughs> so our featured podcast is This Lesbian Ship is Intense, and I will let you hear from them. Hey, everyone. I'm Katie. And I'm V. And we are This Lesbian Ship is Intense. We're a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. And in our podcast, we cover TV shows, movies, and really any other form of media with lesbian characters. We break down shows from a queer point of view. We gush over our favorite ships and we critically analyze the impact of media on our community. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, or SoundCloud. I experienced some planner fatigue this week. Um, I love my planning process, and sometimes I don't use it. <laughs> like, I didn't fill in my planner at all this week. I will today, Sunday, so I will be filling it up for the coming week. I don't know, I just felt fatigued. Like, sometimes you just want to throw everything away for a little while and, and live dangerously. You know, it's the anarchist in me. Like, I don't know what's happening. I know my, my appointments and I know my due dates and I'm just going to freestyle it this week. Just let it all hang out. <laughs> Nothing terrible happened, but I did feel very unmoored and I like the security of having my days planned and knowing that I'm going to get through everything. Definitely didn't get through everything without planning, so there's pros and cons. But you know, maybe it was just a break that was needed from the stringency of my of my plan. Like when plans start to break down, I think subconsciously I want everything to break down. So my plot broke down, my planning system broke down, I lived through the week, I emerged on the other side, and now I'm ready to go back into my my structures again and feel more confident about them. I hope. So that is it for me for this week. I hope that you have a wonderful week. My goals are to get through three more chapters. And if that's the case, I will in two weeks have finished this revision if I don't add more chapters, which I probably will. So we'll see how it goes. And I'll talk to you next week. For episode show notes and to sign up for the footnotes newsletter and get the show notes in your inbox, go to myimaginaryfriendsshow.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and watch the video episodes on YouTube. I would really appreciate a rating or review to help support the show. And My Imaginary Friends is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more fantastic podcasts, go to frolic.media slash podcasts.